Any reports concerning uh, overnight activities at the Lasso Fray? Um, nothing significant. Um, in the report yesterday, we mentioned that we had a few small earthquakes um, during the day yesterday. Um, I think a few of them were, were long period events. But um, it's nothing compared to what the volcano was doing um, leading up to the explosions. Um, it's more or less gone back to um, pre-explosion um, activity. Well, in terms of the seismics, it's fairly quiet seismically. All right. And uh, after yesterday, we had a, a couple of questions commenting on our WhatsApp. Uh, uh, there was this question, the new vent that was created, is it something to worry about? That was a question from a listener. No, no, it's not. Um, basically, what the new vent would have done was um, reconfigure the, the, the crater mm -hmm. or the upper parts of the crater. So I think what that would lead to is that maybe after this eruption, if there is no dome big enough to fill that, that crater, you might end up with a lake um, eventually when this um, eruption stops and the, um, the rain fills up that crater, the hole in the crater, you will actually probably get another lake uh, as you had from what I got uh, leading up to the 1971 event. All right. So what's the daily SO2 that is being uh, released from the, vol the volcano daily? I know there might be yeah, that's, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's varying a bit. We we took a measurement on Sunday, and it was um, just over 200 tons per day. Um, one week before, which was the Sunday before, it was around a tons, a thousand tons per day. And we need to to try and figure out what's causing it to to move around like that, because when we measure. Um, gas or any sort of gas, we're making a number of um, assumptions. We are assuming that what we're measuring is everything that's coming from the source or is coming from the source totally. It's being modulated by the source. Right. I mean, not, that may not be the case. We could, as I said, if there is a dome up there, which we don't know, it could be like affecting how easy the gas can come out. And basically it would affect what we see. Um, we're also assuming that everything we're measuring is everything that's coming out of the top, which may not be the case as well. So there are a number of things that we need to, to constrain first before we can um, say anything without any, well, or anything with, with much confidence about what the gas actually means. But I think what we can, we can say right now is that if you're seeing a thousand tons per day, it suggests that the the situation right. that the volcano is in has not stopped yet. Now, that does not mean that we will get more explosions or more violent activity. Um, basically, we're in a position where it might be stopping, but we can't say for certain that it's stopping because we haven't seen that sort of arm signal yet to say that it stopped. So it could be on the way to stop in, right. or it could be just resting. We still have to, to wait and see. But right now, the volcano is not in a dangerous um, state. Even though it's pumping up gas, it just tells us that it's still alive. Right. It doesn't tell me that it's it's trying to create problems like it was um, trying to do in March or like it did, sorry, in April when it started with the explosions. So the high gas flux is no need for alarm. It's just the... It's just, uh, a caution that we may not be out of the woods yet. All right, so we can safely say the lesser the tonnage of gas that is uh, released is, is less less worry. We can safely say that. Yes, um, right. the volcanoes behave behave quite differently. Um, different volcanoes would behave different, and the eruptions are manifested in different ways. No, I believe that this one does not. Well, this volcano, La Sofria, does not behave or will not behave like the one in Montserrat. I think this will erupt, and then when it's done erupting, it will stop. So eventually, we would expect the, the sulfur dioxide to fall away to more or less nothing, as you say. And, and pro probably we won't be able to measure anything after a while because it would stop producing sulfur dioxide. So when it gets to that, 
that will be one of the um, signals that will tell us, okay, it's probably stopped. But we can't rely on just sulfur dioxide alone or, or gases alone. We have to rely on um, deformation as well and probably seismics. So it's, you don't rely on one technique to, to diagnose what this volcano is doing, especially in situations like this. So it depends on what's happening at the volcano. Certain techniques are more useful than others. And it would affect how you interpret what we've seen. All right, I know we had some rains and we had some hazy conditions recently. How soon do you think you'll be able to get a visual of, of the crater, so to speak? That's a very good question. Well, I think we're limited in terms of how we can access the crater right now. We are not allowed to, to hike up to the crater um, for obvious reasons. It's not that we can't. Right, right. But it would be unwise to do so, and it would set a bad example. Safety and all. If we, yes, sir, if we did that. So right now, our best option would be to, to try and get some sort of observation flights in, whether it be by someone of us who's, who's working on the team or, or maybe um, requesting one of the S SPG pilots to, to take some photos if they can, if they can see into the, um, the crater, which was the case when the dome was being built. But we need to have a look in the crater to see what's happening because, as I would have mentioned before, one of the most useful tools we have is actually seeing what's happening. If we can see what's happening, then we can, we can make sense or make more sense of, of the data we're collecting. So it's possible that there is a dome in the crater. We just don't know. And knowing would actually help us have a better idea of what the volcano is actually doing currently. All right. I know the, the, the activity has uh, died down, so to speak. Uh, any plans to install new monitoring equipment to, to, to monitor other stuff, seeing that it has died down, so to speak? Yes. I mean, that's, that's definitely something that we're looking forward to doing. Um, over the next couple of weeks, we would have two senior technicians on the ground, um, Mr. Lynch, Mr. Lloyd Lynch, and uh, a son of the soil, um, Pico Williams, who's based in Montserrat. He's, he's, he's quite a good technician also. Um, they should be here at the same time, and hopefully there will be a big push to, to replace some of the instrumentation we've lost and some of it which was not installed before the explosions. So hopefully, if the two of them get here at the same time, and, and, and spend enough time on the ground together, we will be in a better position mm -hmm. than we are now in terms of in instrumentation. Because as, as most people would have known, the explosions more or less cleared all the instruments off the actual volcano, off the rim, and high up on the flanks. So we lost quite a bit of um, instrumentation. We lost a few seismometers, a GPS, and two cameras, and uh, a reflector network. So quite a bit has been lost. All right, four five seven two seven zero five to get in your questions. Magic Jack five one six three five zero nine eight nine one. You can also send your comments or questions via WhatsApp four five seven two seven zero five. I'm Lasso for a morning edition with a good wish of basic needs, a trust fund, facey trading, and the flow. This is how we flow in the program this morning. Volcanologist uh, monitoring the Lasso Frere volcano, Doctor Thomas Christopher. What's the what's the next alert level downwards and uh, would uh, what would be the significant feature or features as compared to the orange level at this time? Well, when before this eruption started um, in December, the alert level I think was um, was probably yellow. Now, when we realized that there was an eruption on, mm -hmm. the alert level changed to orange. And it has been at orange, or it was at orange up until the afternoon of April 8th, when it was shifted to red. Um, now it's back at orange now. And it's back at orange for one reason, and I more or less explain what's happening. We don't think the eruption has stopped yet. Uh, we are not seeing any signals that it has stopped yet. So it's currently at orange because we are not sure if it's totally over. We think it could be erupting. We're still seeing um, quite a bit of gas. Um, there's probably still some minor deformation, still some minor earthquakes. 
So technically, we are in a similar situation to what we were before the, um, the explosions started. Now, I've noticed some people were, um, were talking about the fact that we're in orange and people are still being asked to go back home. But the point is, when the alert level was at orange leading up to the explosions, people were still living in the red zone and all of the orange zones. So the red zone is definitely uninhabitable at the moment because of what, what is happening in there. The major issues with the orange zones is, is the ash on the ground and not so much the, the physical safety of the people in the orange zones. So basically the mindset is that right now the volcano is, is not trying to do that anymore. So it would make sense to, to relax the alert level a bit and allow people to reoccupy, reoccupy places right. which are still safe to reoccupy apart from the discomfort which may be caused by the ash, which would be the orange zones. Now, eventually, when we're certain that the system has shut down and stopped erupting, then the alert level will drop from orange um, down to, to, yellow. to yellow. So, yeah, so, well, I think it's yellow. I might be wrong, but the next one down. So at, at the moment, it's relaxed, but we're not totally sure if, if the all clear is is to be given so we we more or less uh, in a sort of relaxed state but as we keep saying at the end of these reports this system could turn on again right and if it does turn on then we'll have to react accordingly and and raise the alert level if it does so i mean none of us are hoping that it it does you know we want this eruption to to stop so so basically, the idea is it's it's not as dangerous as it as it was a month ago. So we can we can relax a bit, lower guard a bit, and allow people to reoccupy the, the orange zones because um, their lives are not in danger in in the orange zones. Um, in the red zone, your life is definitely in danger from these secondary hazards, but not so much the orange zone. So that's the whole mindset behind what what we're thinking. So the message, of course, is keep out of the red zone because anything can happen at any time, basically. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 recommended that you don't. Um, I know that the the government um, are giving people passes to go in and so forth. I mean, if you really have to try and try and keep keep your time in there to be a minimum, just go and do what you need to do and leave. Um, don't hang around in there because you're basically um, exposing yourself. Um, to, to whatever it is that could happen in there. And, uh, and as, as I said, I mean, it's, it's more dangerous now if you ask me because the secondary hazards will, will, will surprise you more so than the volcano would. So for instance, I mean, if you're in the red zone, you're thinking, okay, if you hear a bang, then you should leave. But what would really be a problem for you in there is probably heavy rains and not so much the volcano going bang. So, we just need to be careful and, and be vigilant about the secondary hazards and, and be aware of, of, of how dangerous situations can be. Right. Someone is asking a question on WhatsApp. Uh, if it was erupts, if the volcano erupts again, how significant would it be at this time as compared to previous, if, if there's a reading? If you... <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a very good question. I don't, I don't think any of us have or has the answer to that question. The... There are a number of things which we can't constrain um, leading up to an, er an eruption. What we can't constrain is how, how big it, it is going to be. And I'm not sure if you follow the, the rhetoric coming from us over the past few weeks, but um, none of us really expected the level of violence this, this eruption brought to the table. So the, the level of violence more or less caught us by surprise. So I think it will be difficult to say what the next one would, would do, how it would unfold. I mean, ideally, what you want is these really gentle dome-building eruptions, effusive eruptions. It builds a dome, and it does not explode. But we can't guarantee that is what's going to happen because there are a number of things, as I said, which would, um, which would affect that. There will be the, the volume of magma that's there to, to erupt and, and how gas-rich mm -hmm. it is, if it's fairly gassy then it, it might generate explosions. 
So it all depends. And then it all depends on how the, how the magma is coming out and how the eruption is developed to unfold as well. If it can release gas easily, then it's a, it's a better scenario. If for whatever reason it's trapping gas, then it could lead to problems. So there are a number of factors which we can't um, constrain. So it's, it's, that's a difficult question to, to answer. It's a good one, mm -hmm. but we, we just can't say enough about, about how it's going to um, turn out. All right, we still encourage your calls. We have a call on the line at 457-2705. Hello, welcome to Ayeng Lassifer Morning's Edition. Good morning. Morning, Johnny. I'd like to ask um, Dr. Christopher a question, please. Go right ahead. He's listening. Um, Dr. Christopher, should there be a, um, an explosive eruption? Um, would the instruments be able to detect it? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. Um, the, the instruments that we launched are quite close... To the to the dome or actually on the crater rim so what it prevents us from doing is is to see these smaller events the very small ones probably similar to what was happening before long before the explosions or the earthquake started properly these okay. things that we were calling these dome emplacement events now i'm fairly certain that if the activity goes back to what it was in the week leading up to the explosions with these earthquakes Mm -hmm. The network will definitely see them because these earthquakes, the ones that were being felt by people, they're fairly large. Yeah. So we would we would definitely see them. We would not see all of the smaller ones, but we would see the bigger ones, and we would we would know enough to know that okay, we have we have a problem. So I don't think we're totally blind. We're we're probably partially sighted at the moment, but we we can still see. An explosion and uh, um, similar to one which occurred on the twenty second of April. Would the would the would the instruments be able to de detect such an explosion? Yes, sir. I mean, we we saw all of them. Um, I think the problem for us is is seeing them coming. I mean, when they start, you 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 see them on the drums, but sometimes there were probably one or two which which probably snuck upon us and we didn't really see it coming until it it, it actually got going uh -huh. properly. Um, but that depends on, on on how many earthquakes happen leading up to to the explosion. So if, if for whatever reason it's it's a it's a more subtle or or silent event, then we won't uh -huh. really see it coming uh -huh. that easy. And I mean, let me just say that the the ones that we didn't really see coming properly were were more or less the smaller ones, which which were happening at the back end. So I uh -huh. guess by that time the system was was running out of energy, so uh -huh. it wasn't. It wasn't kicking up a lot before uh -huh. it exploded, for want of a better word. So, so the one with it, it didn't make enough noise. The one with the on the 22nd of April, how would you categorize that as being? Yeah, that, 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 you have to remember that during that time, the, 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 the duration between the explosions were, were varying a bit. So we were trying to, to figure out how that time was changing. Uh -huh. And as I said, because it was small, we didn't really see it coming on probably till probably till about 15 to 20 minutes before it actually got going. We okay, realized okay. that we might we might be having a problem. Uh, I think for uh, the others, for the others, um, for the earlier ones, it was it was fairly easy to see uh, them coming after a day or two. But uh, as as the as the pattern changes, then you have to keep trying to figure out what is changing to uh, um, on the fly. Uh, one other question. Um, after an explosion, is it normal to smell sulfur? I mean, yes, sir. I mean, if you if you're in the right location, as in downwind of the volcano, you will you will smell sulfur. Uh -huh. I mean, if you if you spoke to any of the um, the coast guard personnel who who has been on that boat with me, uh -huh. I mean, whenever we go and measure that gas, I mean, they they smell that sulfur really strongly because we have to we have to go through that plume quite a few times. Yeah, yeah. And you you see them react to the smell of it. You know, they, okay. they vocalize and, you know, they cover yeah. their noses and stuff. Right. So if you're in the right place, as in downwind, wherever the wind is carrying the gas and you're there, you will smell it. Okay. So fine. I'm guessing after these explosions, there would be a bit more sulfur floating around in the air. In the air. So it would probably be easier for you to smell it. All right, Doctor. Thank you very much. You're welcome, sir. And thank you very much for your calls. Dr. Now you wanted to touch a little on the gas in this morning. Yeah, well, yeah, I just because because I realized that the the high values seem to be um 
causing some alarm. And some people think that there's a there's mixed messages here in terms of okay, we're having high gas, but yet the alert level is orange. Uh -huh. But as I was trying to explain, the high gas by itself is not diagnostic of a pending explosion or a pending increased activity. Um, you could think of the sulfur dioxide flux as the pulse of the volcano. It has a pulse, but it doesn't tell you how active it is. It just tells you that it's alive right now. Stick Basically, up in what there. we need to do... Sorry? Uh, stick up in there. We have a call, and then we'll continue. You're live on NBC. Yes. Hello, good morning. Welcome to the program. Hello. Good morning. Welcome to the program. It's I, am, I, I have a question. Go right ahead with a question. So the volcano don't stop erupt. Hello? The volcano don't erupt. If it if it stop erupting? Yeah. Oh, we had that question answered before. We are not sure. The doctor will the, the, the volcanologist will, will will answer your question. Yeah, we, a, it, that's a young listener asking if, if the if the yeah, volcano I, I, stopped I noticed, erupting. I noticed. Um we're not quite sure and People need to understand if we if we're not sure about something, we can't say, say for sure. that we are sure because it would be dangerous and reckless to do so. So, as I said, right now activity has dropped off; it's fallen away. But there are a number of other things we need to to confirm before we can definitely say that it has stopped. And some of it we don't have. So we're still discussing what the state of the volcano is and and what we think is going on with it. But I think it's fair to say that um, the volcano is a lot safer than it was a month ago. I think that's that's a, a, a safe statement to make. So I think people can can breathe easier now, given the state it's in, versus what it was doing in um, in mid-April. All right. Continue your thoughts, Doc, on uh, the degassing. Yes. So yeah, as I was saying, the the sulfur dioxide flux gives us a, a diagnostic. And it gives us a, an idea of, of, of whether or not the volcano is still alive. Um, I haven't collected enough data from this volcano and correlated the sulfur dioxide flux with the magma flux rate at the surface. So I can't say for certain that if you're getting more gas out of the volcano, then you're getting more magma out of the top. We don't. We can't make that correlation. Right. That works for some volcanoes, but I can't say that works here because... I haven't been able to, to tie those two things together. Um, it's quite difficult to constrain how much magma is coming out at the top because, it, well, it's hard to see what's happening in your volcano. So, so right now, I can't use it, the sulfur dioxide flux or anything else other than to tell you, okay, the volcano seems to be still alive or the eruption seems to be still ongoing. Um, and that is as much as I can say for now until I can get more information, which would help me understand better what what it may mean and then i could, could shed some more light on what we think the ramifications of of these values are um I, I must also mention that the there was an instrument i was using when i just got here which is called the multigas and i am still actually using that while i'm, I'm generating these um so2 fluxes so basically while I'm, I'm collecting the sulfur dioxide flux data, I'm actually running the multigas, which is collecting um, concentration data for these four gases, which I keep mentioning, which is the two sulfur species, sulfur dioxide, hydrogen sulfide, carbon dioxide, and water. So I am basically generating a flux data set for those four gases also. But those are the three gases. So I'm getting CO2 flux data, water flux, and hydrogen sulfide flux. And all of those are, are helping me to, to figure out what the volcano is doing. Because as I would have mentioned um, sometime in the past, the different gases are coming from different parts of the system. They're coming from, some are coming from quite deep, such as the carbon dioxide and the water. Some are coming from the middle of the system, or less the, the sulfur ones. And then when you go shallower, you get the hydrogen chloride and hydrogen fluoride coming off. So when I look at the the ratios of these gases, the, the plume chemistry gives me an idea of what part of the system is contributing mostly to the degassing we're seeing at the surface. And that would give me an idea of, of, of what state the eruption is. So for instance, 
when I got here in January, the, one of the first sets of measurements I took showed me that there was a deep magma that was degassing. I mean, one that we couldn't see, I mean, but that magma showed its face on April 9th, but we knew it was there. Right. Um, there was no guarantee that it was going to erupt, but we knew there was deep degassing. So basically, what we need to see is that deep degassing signal go away and it switches back to either shallow degassing or hydrothermal composition. And then we'll be happy that, yeah, it's totally shut off and it's um, it's not going to be causing a problem anytime soon. All right, we'll take the final call. Hello, good morning. Welcome to the program. Hello, good morning. Hello, good morning. Welcome to... Hello. Hello, good morning. Hello, good morning. Welcome to the program. Go right ahead with the question. Hello? Hello? I want to ask you a question. Go right ahead with the question. When when we will go back home first? I'm not quite hearing you. When we will go back home? Home to where? If it's the red zone, you you'll have to the wait. Red zone, yeah, well, yeah. Well, we don't know that yet, and you'll have to wait until uh, the the persons, the Nemo, the government, and uh, those persons in authority who know able to tell us that. We wouldn't be able to know that yet. But right now, those persons in the orange zone zone can go back. All right, uh, Dr. Christopher. As we wrap up, with your final thoughts. Yeah, um, yeah, I just want to reassure people that, that we're still able to do our jobs, although probably at a slightly reduced capacity. And hopefully within the next few weeks, we will increase our capacity to, to monitor this volcano better. Um, as I said, we, we're hoping that this eruption is dying off, but we can't be certain yet. So at the moment, we cannot give the all clear because it would be reckless to do so. And you could you could imagine how unforgiving the population would be if we were to say, you know, it's it stopped and then in a few days, you know, it's it, it's it's giving trouble again. So we need to be fairly certain that it's it stopped before we, we give the all clear because what we don't want is to is to create a situation where we're telling people, okay, it's safe to go back and then you know, a few days later or a few weeks later, we, we're saying, okay, you know, we were sorry, but that was a mistake. You need to leave. That would that would more or less make things more difficult for the government and it would frustrate people and they would become um, uncooperative. So at the end of the day, you know, one, one of the things I want to highlight is, you know, we have achieved a lot here. When I say we, I mean we, and I mean everybody. I mean, the people of St. Vincent, the government of St. Vincent, the officials, um, Nemo, the police force, the fire department, you know, and the scientists. Because if the people of St. Vincent did not listen and comply to what was happening or what was being said, this would not have worked. Right. You know, people, people voluntarily moved when they were asked to move. They did what they were asked to do. And that really helped a lot. Because if, if we had an uncompliant population, things would have been very different. So this was a proper team effort by everyone involved. You know, although it may not seem that way, but to me, it was a proper team effort. And without the population on board who, 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 were, who were able to, or willing to listen to us, you know, and, and accept our advice, you know, I think we would have been in a very different situation. So I think we, we've achieved a lot here. And it is very important that it's not undone by bad practices in the future where people are, are exposing themselves in the red zone or on the volcano. I think it's it's important to to keep that slate clean in terms of no casualties and no injuries from, from the eruption. Right. Well, that, let me thank you very much, uh, Doc, for being on the program this morning. Continue to stay safe and thanks, as usual, for your expertise. Have a great right. one. Thanks a lot. All right. Bye. Bye. That uh, was a uh, morning's edition of Eyeing Last of Fire here on NBC. On the program, we had volcanologist uh, Dr. Thomas Christopher, the lead scientist at this time, monitoring the Last of Fire volcano. 
want to thank our callers, persons who sent uh, questions via WhatsApp, and our listeners. Thanks for being a part of the program.